When one thinks of a Major League Baseball town with two teams, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles usually come to mind. Not a city such as Cincinnati. But in the year 1891, that was indeed the case. Cincinnati had the distinction of having two Major League Baseball teams. And oddly enough, both clubs were referred to as the Cincinnati Reds. One Reds team played in the National League on the west side of town, while the other Reds team played in the American Association on the east side of town. This is the story of the forgotten Cincinnati Reds team of the American Association, a team that history has affectionately renamed the Kelly's Killers. In the 19th century, Major League Baseball was not an institution the way it is now. It was more like a series of carnivals that may appear or disappear at a moment's notice. Different Major Leagues would come and go. Teams closed up shop regularly or jumped from one league to another. By the time the 19th century had ended, baseball had seen five Major Leagues come and go with only the National League surviving. The Reds club that we know today was born and established in a major league called the American Association. Cincinnati played in the association for eight years. Following the 1889 season, Reds ownership decided to move their franchise to the older and better managed National League. However, a turbulent baseball season was over the horizon due to the fact that the National League and the American Association had to contend with a new major league for the 1890 season. The new circuit was called the Players League and was led by Hall of Famer John Montgomery Ward. The 1890 season was tough on all three leagues, and by season's end, all three circuits were hurting, including a number of their clubs. Cincinnati was in fact one of those clubs. The Reds were teetering on bankruptcy and club owner Aaron Stern withdrew his franchise from the National League. He then sold the Reds to Players League investors headed by Cleveland trolley car entrepreneur Albert Johnson. Johnson's plan was to move his newly acquired club into the Players League for the 1891 season. The National League, who had just lost the Reds, in turn granted wealthy clothing merchant John T. Brush the vacant spot for a brand new Cincinnati club. Meanwhile, Johnson's plans to move the Reds unraveled when the Players League folded in January of 1891. Johnson then turned his attention toward the American Association, the same league that the Reds had left in 1889. The association, who regretted letting the team go in the first place, gladly welcomed the club back into the fold. However, shortly after Johnson's commitment to the association, and for reasons unknown, he sold the Reds back to the National League for a sum less than what he initially paid for the club. John T. Brush, who was promised the new Cincinnati League franchise, simply took control over the Reds as if they never left the National League in the first place. The move was a crushing blow for the struggling American Association. They had lost the Cincinnati Reds again. But the league persisted in maintaining the Cincinnati market. As a result, the association installed a new Cincinnati franchise to fill the void that the Reds were to occupy. When all was said and done, Cincinnati had two major league franchises competing during the 1891 baseball season. The new Cincinnati Association team was owned by eccentric German businessman Chris von der A. Von der A, who also owned the association St. Louis Browns, was a larger-than-life character. With his bushy mustache and exaggerated German accent, von der A was the first baseball owner with a significant public persona. During Browns games, he would sit in a special box behind third base with a whistle and binoculars. 
He would use the whistle to get the attention of players and occasionally for someone to fetch him a beer. He was a perfect fit for Cincinnati's German population. Before there was Babe Ruth, there was Mike Kelly. The king, as he was known, had a larger-than-life persona and established himself as the first superstar of baseball. Considered one of the best defensive catchers of his time, Kelly is credited with the innovation of many baseball strategies, such as the hit-and-run and the catcher backing up first base. His base running skills were legendary, and his famous hook slide even became the subject of a hit song written in 1889 by vaudeville comedian J.W. Kelly. The King began his illustrious career in Cincinnati, playing for the first National League club during the 1878 and 1879 baseball seasons. He then moved on to play for Cap Anson's Chicago White Stockings, where he helped the club win five National League pennants during a seven-year stint. Following the 1886 season, Chicago sold Kelly to the Boston Bean Eaters for a then record sum of $10,000. The city of Boston was thrilled to get him. Kelly played with the Bean Eaters for three seasons before jumping to the Boston entry in the Players League. His Players League club went on to win the league's only pennant. Following the demise of the Players League, Boston Reds owner Charles Prince decided to unload his biggest star, Mike Kelly. Prince's Boston club was set to play in the American Association, but Kelly threatened to retire unless he could return to Cincinnati where he began his playing career. Kelly would get his wish, and the King returned to the Queen City as player manager of the new association club. After Kelly was named player manager of the Cincinnati Reds, he, along with Vonder A, began to assemble a roster. By the end of March, the club had secured a healthy collection of seasoned veterans and promising youths in Emmett Seary, Ed Andrews, Yank Robinson, Dick Johnston, Cannonball Crane, Farmer Vaughn, Matt Kilroy, Frank Dwyer, and Art Whitney. While the roster was taking shape, ownership began looking for a place to play. The club considered the Avenue Grounds, which was located a few miles north of the National League Reds ballpark but the ballpark was subject to an option by the league Reds and was unavailable. The Association Reds decided to build a new ballpark instead. With vacant lots in the city proper being few and far between, the club would have to look towards the outskirts of the city. Sites under consideration were the Full Mile Driving Park in Oakley, the Woodruff Estate in Clifton, and even a site near the Licking River in Covington, Kentucky. However, when all was said and done, the club owners settled for a suburb of Cincinnati called East End in the Pendleton Grounds. Contracts for the grading, sodding, and draining of the ballpark were opened immediately, along with bidding on the erection of the grandstand pavilion, bleachers, and fences. All were settled by the end of March with the contract for the park being awarded to well-known Cincinnati contractor Al Marcus. Marcus was the same contractor that built League Park for the Reds in short order before the start of the 1884 season. The ballpark was built in the northwest corner of the Pendleton Grounds, which was located along the beautiful setting of the Ohio River. The ballpark ran along Ridgley Street and parallel with modern-day Babby Alley. The grandstand was octagon in shape, which seated about 1,000 fans and faced in the direction of the Ohio River. Included was a pavilion with adjoined bleachers. Altogether, East End Park seated about 5,000 spectators. Due to the remote location of the park, fans needed a series of ways to get to the grounds. One way was by streetcars, which were pulled by mules. Other means were by train or steamboat. Fans could take a 20-minute train ride on the Pennsylvania from Broadway Street and Court Street, or pick the train up at the foot of Vine Street by the suspension bridge. Since East End Park was one of the few major league parks that was accessible by river, fans also could opt for a 20-minute steamboat ride on the Coney Island Steamers, Missouri, or Gilding Star.
the Association Reds got off to a less than spectacular start. With delays in their ballpark, Cincinnati was forced to play the first two weeks of the season on the road. The Reds weren't set to make their home debut until April 18th, but with poor spring weather, delays in the construction of their ballpark were unavoidable. Mike Kelly's Reds spent most of April on the road, making their home debut on April 25th. To make matters worse, a number of players, including Kelly, were suffering from the flu. By the time the club played their first game at home, Cincinnati was in the cellar of the association standings. When the Reds did finally make their home appearance, the club was treated like royalty. Business manager Frank Bancroft staged an elaborate opening day parade that started from the Grand Hotel in downtown Cincinnati and made the trek down Eastern Avenue to the baseball grounds. The players all arrived in fancy carriages led by Cincinnati's renowned Weber's Band, who played Slide Kelly Slide. Easton Park and all the neighboring buildings were lavishly decorated with colorful buntings and flags with the outer line of the field defined with omnibuses, dog carts, surrey wagons, and other vehicles. 6,000 East Siders crammed into Easton Park to watch their very own Reds Club take on the defending association champion Louisville's. Despite the grand ceremonies and extraordinary enthusiasm for the locals, the Reds lost the contest by a score of 11 to nine. The following day, the two teams took to the diamond again in what was the first major league game played on Sunday in the Queen City since 1889. Baseball and fans of the great game were victims of the Blue Law, which restricted many activities on Sunday. Cincinnati's mayor, John Mosby, included baseball in these restrictions. Following a 12-6 loss, all players from both teams were promptly arrested and taken to the police station to be booked. Before a game on May 24th against the Philadelphia Athletics, Cincinnati's police chief Philip Deitch and 75 of his officers were waiting at East End Park. Dressed in full regimental uniforms, his men marched like a military unit around the grounds. When game time arrived, the players nervously took the field. Philadelphia went to bat first and completed the top of the first inning without incident. But when the Reds' Emmett Seary stepped up to the plate, in their half of the inning, Chief Deitch threw up his hands, declared the game over, and arrested all the players. As the season wore on, the Reds continued to lose. However, Mike Kelly certainly lived up to his reputation as a surly and somewhat quirky ball player. For instance, in keeping with his Irish roots, Mike Kelly pushed club owners to dress as men in green stockings, something that was rare in those days. The owners refused. But Kelly went ahead and dressed his killers in green stockings anyway. Before games, he frequently took swims in the Ohio River. Once, following a loss, Kelly swigged some whiskey and thought it a good idea to take a night swim. Overdoing his exercises, he nearly drowned. Mike Kelly's star power brought fans out from all over the association. Kelly, who had never played in the league, was treated in grand fashion with every stop. This was never more prominent than when Cincinnati took on Kelly's former team in Boston. Before a game on May 6th, Kelly was presented with a handsome wagonette with an iron gray horse and a four foot high floral horseshoe. All of this while the National Guard band struck up, hail to the chief and for he's a jolly good fellow. Kelly's antics and superstar talent were exactly what Red's ownership was looking for when they signed him. They were hoping that his charisma, charm, and popularity would bring the fans out to East End Park in throngs. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case. The talent that surrounded Kelly was subpar at best, and his club lost far more games than they won, never ranking higher than fourth in the standings. To make matters worse, the location of the park provided too remote for fans. Despite every attempt by Red's management to make public transportation available, Easton Park was just too far away from the downtown area. Despite a handful of great crowds, the club only averaged about 1,400 fans per game. By August, the club's management began exploring new sites on the west side of the city, looking for a place to construct a new ballpark for the 1892 season. However, with the club losing tons of money in its current state, 
it was decided by league leaders and club ownership to suspend the franchise until 1892. So after an apathetic loss to the St. Louis Browns on August 17th, Cincinnati's East End Reds would cease operations. The Milwaukee Brewers of the Western League stepped in and played the rest of Cincinnati's schedule for 1891. While the plan in place was to revive the franchise in a new ballpark for the 1892 season, this turned out not to be. The American Association was collapsing and a merger between the Association and the National League took place in December of 1891. St. Louis, Baltimore, Washington, and Louisville were all accepted into the National League, while the other franchises were paid to go away. Cincinnati never played host to two major league teams again. As time marched on, the 1891 Association Reds, or Kelly's Killers as they would come to be known, would be a scarce footnote to the long and ballyhooed Cincinnati baseball tradition. After the demise of Mike Kelly's Reds, most of the players simply faded into obscurity with the exception of shortstop Jim Canavan, backup catcher Farmer Vaughn, and pitcher Frank Dwyer. All three players returned to Cincinnati, playing for the League Reds. Canavan played for two seasons, while Vaughn and Dwyer both went on to have eight solid years as a Red. Dwyer went on to collect a total of 132 victories for Cincinnati, which ranks eighth on the Reds' all-time wins list, and will eventually land him in the Reds' Hall of Fame. Business manager Frank Bancroft went on to fill the same position with the League Reds, where he took his opening day festivities with him. It was he who established opening day as the civic event that it is known as today. For this, Frank Bancroft became known as the father of opening day. Bancroft remained the Reds business manager until 1920. The club honored him with a plaque which was displayed at Crosley Field for more than four decades. After the Association Reds vacated East End Park, the ball yard would continue to host amateur baseball, but nearly became the temporary home of the National League Reds in 1900. During the season, a fire erupted at League Park destroying the main grandstand, part of the pavilion, and the team's clubhouse. Red's ownership considered relocating the club to the vacant East End Park until they could build a new facility. Red's ownership abandoned the idea and opted to play a handful of home games on the road while minor adjustments were made to their park in order for the club to finish out the season. The grounds where East End Park was once located still exists today and is currently known as Schmidt Recreation Complex where a number of baseball diamonds currently sit. Two of the diamonds overlap where Easton Park once sat. More than 100 years after Mike Kelly's Reds took to the field, the great game of ball is still being played on the site. As for Mike Kelly, he would return to Beantown, where he would play for two more pennant winners. However, it was no secret that Kelly's skills were on the decline, and following the 1893 season with the New York Giants, Mike Kelly retired from Major League Baseball. After his retirement, Kelly toured the vaudeville circuit, where he entertained crowds from the stage much like he did on the baseball diamond. On November 8, 1894, Mike Kelly passed away in a Boston hospital from pneumonia. He was 36. The king was gone, forever, to be etched into baseball lore as one of the greatest players of the 19th century. Michael Joseph Kelly was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1945 where he will forever be enshrined. I played a game of baseball, I did land the case is nine. The crowd was clean and jolly and the weather it was fine. A nobler lot of players I think were never found. When the omnibuses landed that day upon the ground, the game was quickly started. They slipped me to the bat. I made two strikes as Daisy Warado striking at. I made the third, the catcher moved and to the ground it fell. Then I run like a devil to first base. When the gang began to yell, Oh, slide, Kelly, slide. You're running out of great. Slide, Kelly, slide. Stay there, hold your base. If someone doesn't steal you, and your pattern doesn't fail you, then take you to Australia, slide. 